As the election happens uh, just in the next day or two here, depending on when you watch this video, I wanted to give you a little bit of perspective from Europe. Um, I've been talking with a whole lot of people from all over Europe, uh, a few Americans here and there, but one of the things that just really stuck out to me is nobody here cares. Now, I know I, I watch the news constantly. I'm reading basically anything that comes out. I know a lot of you guys are watching the news uh, quite a bit as well, and this this whole election has sucked you in, um, and you're not able to really kind of get out of it and imagine people who don't care. Um, I have been surrounded by people here in Europe that just don't care. And it's been refreshing, <laughs> honestly. And that is a little bit of a concern, but also a little bit of perspective I want to add. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that perspective, um, sucking out just a little bit from the election, and then also really kind of putting us in our place. Where does the United States fit in the world when it comes to freedom, when it comes to uh, happiness? Uh, and this is, this is important stuff. We need to have this conversation because everybody wants to be free, um, but that means something different to every single person. America has wanted to be free and has sought freedom, um, but we've meant something by that that I think a lot of people today don't understand and don't want. Let's jump into it. Well, uh, welcome to the Poplar Report. If you haven't been here before, I'm Steve Poplar. I'm an accountant by trade. I have been over here in Europe. I'm in Portugal now uh, awaiting my flight, uh, but uh, I will be back in America uh, very, very shortly, um, <laughs> just in time for the big show. So I've been talking to Germans, I've been talking to British folks. Um, I walked a good bit with a, with a guy um, <laughs> from the UK, and uh, if he's watching, hey, how's it going? Um, and uh, we talked a lot about uh, this, this whole concept of liberal, uh, libertarianism, this leave me alone, uh, small government, you know, kind of like... F um, fiscally conservative, libertarian mindset of small government, government that doesn't uh, take away your rights um, without the, uh, the, the government intrusion. And uh, he asked me an interesting question um, as I was kind of explaining a whole bunch of like why it's better. And he was, he was like, I've never heard any of this before. He went to Oxford, but uh, uh, <laughs> hadn't ever heard... Uh, anyone really lay out the case for libertarianism or small government in, in a way that uh, did sound crazy. But one of the things he kept asking me about was, but how do you make sure that, that you're still taking care of the most vulnerable in society? So basically, he, want, he, wanted, he wanted the benefits of freedom, but without the consequences. The idea that, that people should be able to achieve what they want to achieve, but they should also get freebies and handouts. Um, they should still be protected. And, and I pointed him towards the idea that that's not so much an economic thing. Um, when you're talking about freedom, when you're talking about small government, then it really becomes our responsibility. And it really comes down to whether we are good people or not. And I think that's something that we've kind of thrown out of the conversation a little bit. Um, I know that you and I, and in, in the channels, in this space, the preparedness, prepper spaces, we, we do talk about these things a lot. But I think in the conservative circles, this idea of freedom, if you have freedom, then everything will be fine. No. If you have freedom and you have bad people and you have evil people, it's, it's really bad. Um, you can go to a bunch of places in the world where they have freedom because the government's not in control, uh, but other people are in control. You have gangs, you have warlords, you have, um, you have cartels, you have a lack of government, a very small government from their perspective. They don't have to pay taxes. This is great. But then they have the local warlords and they function as governments. And really the question is, is how close do you want the government to be to you? And that's not a good, that's not a good conversation to have. Uh, you, don't, you don't want to trade in a federal government 
for a cartel that rules your neighborhood or or a Venezuelan gang that has taken over your apartment complex. I think we all can agree on that, that, that that's not the direction we want to go in. We want to go in the direction where we can all be productive members of society without the burden of government, uh, where we can then interact freely with each other uh, for things that are of mutual interest to ourselves. Uh, we, can, we can have schools. We can work together to have schools. Whether they're paid out of our own pocket or whether we do have a local taxing authority that, that still supports school choice. I don't know. But let's take a step back and look at America in the world at large. Still, America is one of the freest places in the world. Um, I used to say the freest place in the world, but I think that that, that is starting to get challenged. Um, there are some... El Salvador is doing some pretty amazing things down there. Argentina has been turning the corner. And uh, I, I would say that we're probably not the freest place in the world anymore. But I think Europeans fundamentally don't understand America. So the people that are in Europe that are interested in our elections mostly just want to know how much free stuff they're going to get from America, which, yeah, <clears throat> how much free stuff America is going to give them or, or free defense or free um, military cover. Uh, they want a strong America that's going to give them their free stuff. Or they see the political struggle in the United States through their political lens. Um, so their political parties in their country or whatever, they see all that and then they kind of like project that on us. And, and we do the same thing to them. Don't, don't get me wrong. We're always kind of like, we look at the parties in another country and the conflict and we're always like, oh, well, these guys are like, they're like the Republicans and these guys, they're like the Democrats. And then the other four or five parties, well, they're kind of like, we have a hard time with that. <laughs> we have a hard time holding more than two, two parties, two political persuasions or whatever. Anyway, um, so other countries project on us, but they also don't understand the freedom. Um, United States still holds a vestige, while we still have our boomsticks, that we are still free. You go to the UK, they're not free. I mean, it, it's, it's really a joke. I mean, they, they make noises as if they're free. They, they basically get told by their government, oh, we have working democracy here, and it's, it's fantastic. Same thing with France and these other places. But anytime anyone really steps out of line... Um, they just get disappeared and there's no, there's no checks and balances. There, there's no, you can't, you can't stand up to the government. The government just will quash you. What are you going to do? Take out your rolling pins and tr go up against the government? No, <laughs> that's not serious. In the United States, even one person who doesn't like what the government is doing kind of can make a stand. Like they, um, I don't know if you know, uh, remember the, uh, the killdozer. Now I'm not saying that guy was, uh, uh, you know, on the level, uh, the more you look at that, the more you kind of get the idea that this guy wasn't really, wasn't really there all the way. But the killdozer was one man with resources who decided to, um, go out with a bang, so to speak. And he did. Uh, he, he leveled a bunch of buildings, businesses of, of people that he, he felt had wronged him. And uh, in America, you can kind of pull that off. Uh, other countries, no, not, not really. No, you can't really do that. What makes the United States unique or has made it unique in the past is this desire for freedom and being willing to accept the consequences of that and a genuine concern for others. Um, and that's what's really put us on the map around the world. Not only did we come and save everyone from, from Germany back in World War II, but after that, we, we had this genuine concern for the Germans, which nobody really understood. They're all kind of like, what are you doing? Like, those are the bad guys. 
And we're like, oh no, they're, they're not they're not the bad guys anymore. They're they're now normal people. We're we're done with the war. The French weren't thinking that way. The UK was kind of like, what? No. <laughs> Uh, all the other European allies were just like, I mean, the Russians really stuck it to the Germans, you know, um, because they still saw them as the enemy. The United States has has always had this benevolent, well, relatively recently, let's, let's say it at least that way, um, since World War II and onward, we, we've had this idea of we've tried to rule the world in such a way that we're doing good for people. Uh, the British, mm, eh, I mean, they, they made some noises like that, but generally when they had their empire, they were, they were, <laughs> they did a lot of stuff just for them. And it was pretty, pretty clear. I mean, it was, they, they, they said, it. whereas the United States always kind of couches everything in like we're fighting for democracy, we're, we're trying to protect people and we're, we're, we're trying to do good. And the United States has, has really backed that up uh, by and large. Uh, we've we've had freedom, which has allowed us to be prosperous and powerful. But we've used that power to for the good of mankind as best we've been able to do, I guess. So that brings us back to this question from my British friend: How can you have freedom and yet still take care of the most vulnerable? Guarantee that the most vulnerable people. And he, he, he kept coming back to, it has to be the government that does it. You know, I mean, we can't just leave it up to people. Like, what if they don't want to take care of these people? And uh, I brought it back to family, community, and, uh, and honestly, religion. Um, you, you need to have, like, a religious system that holds families and communities to account. Um, there really is no other way. And... If you don't have this check on government authority, if you don't have this real, vibrant, religious system that, that stands apart from government, that can kind of critique government, and can organize people outside the government. I mean, the United States is at a point where, where people don't organize at all for anything anymore. Um, they get on their Netflix, they get on their YouTube channels. I mean... As scary as it sounds, YouTube may be the most organized networking that we do uh, in, in a lot of places. If people aren't part of a local church, if they aren't part of a local club of some sort, beyond that, I mean, people just aren't connected. And disconnected, isolated people are easy to control. Because you get, you get them to pop off one at a time. They, they each reach their breaking point one at a time, and the government can easily de deal with individuals. It's when you have groups that becomes much more of a problem, especially when a group starts to uh, inspire other groups. And that's where we really are. We talk about the mutual assistance groups, MAGs. Uh, we talk about, um, I talk a lot about churches. I talk about uh, over on my other channel, the Bible channel, I talk to you out, out of the Bible why churches, but here I'll say the same thing. If you want to find like-minded people, you probably should go to church because that's where you're going to find a lot of them. Homeschooling co-ops, big place to connect with people. Um, like farmers who are selling meat, um, selling cattle, connecting with those people, big deal. Um, even farmers markets, less so, but but farmers markets, you may still connect with uh, some really interesting people there. Uh, there's there's a number of different places where you can find people that are kind of like minded, um, but but churches are the most ubiquitous, are the most um, prolific. <laughs> there's churches everywhere, and oftentimes people in preparedness groups and uh, preparedness minded folks and and conservatives, uh, libertarians go to church. And that's just, if you go to a Bible-believing church, you're probably not going to find too many leftists there um, because the Bible doesn't talk about the 897 genders. Uh, it just doesn't. <laughs> it says, I mean, with, with all that, I mean, 
how could a leftist really go and actually allow somebody to read? I mean, you have to censor people reading out of the Bible. So it's a place where things tend to be a little less woke, right? Uh, connecting with people at school boards, but a lot of people in your community are going to be homeschooling or just not having kids, right? So how can we protect society members? We need to be good people. And that's where we really need to come back to. Because survival is not the goal. Survival can't be the goal. Now, you can stock up food, you can uh, get your garden going, you can um, be stocking up meds, you can be stocking up all sorts of stuff. But survival can't be the goal. If it is, I promise you, you're going to be very, very disappointed. You're going to look around two weeks into the apocalypse and go, you know what, I'm not sure I really want to be here for this. You need to have a goal. And I would humbly suggest the goal is being good and being in good relationships with people as well as with God. Being good is, uh, I, I don't think that's the way you earn a good relationship with God. You can't earn a relationship with God. Um, but if you have a relationship with God, you will then endeavor to be good, right? He will inspire you to be good. And let's just say, when it comes to my neighbor... And my interactions with my neighbor, I would rather a neighbor who is seeking to be good uh, than one who isn't. If they don't know God, if they don't have a personal relationship with God, but they're trying to be a good person, um, they, tend to, they tend to be a better neighbor than if they don't. Can, can, can we agree on that? Um, to have some objective standard and then try to live up to that standard, I think is important. Societally, and for the glue of society kind of come together. The idea that we can have freedom from consequences and yet still have freedom of our actions. Freedom, from act, from freedom of our actions and freedom from consequences. That is like, that doesn't work. If you want to have freedom from your conference consequences, then you have to allow the government or someone else to take away your legitimate choices or at least to mute them. If they are going to pay you resources, they first have to steal those resources from somebody. And if you're a productive member of society, I promise you they're gonna be stealing more from you than they're gonna be giving you. And if you like that, well then you are just weird. You're just weird. Uh, taxes are theft, and we all know it. All of us who pay them. So I recommend that that, that that should be our goals, is to be good and to be in good relationships. Good relationship with your family, good relationship with your neighbors, good relationship with society. Um, doesn't mean you have to be like super buddy-buddy close to everybody, but it does mean that, that you're not doing bad stuff to people and you are doing good stuff. It's not good enough to just not be bad, okay? There's a lot, there lots of not bad people out there who are literally just flavorless, bleh, okay? They're like uh, unflavored oatmeal, okay? I mean, it's just, no, <laughs> okay? You need to be good. You need to actually do good things, things that you don't benefit from. You need to treat people fairly in your, in your interactions with people, but then you also need to actually contribute and give, right? Give beyond uh, what is expected. You know, it's, it's like uh, five guys, right? They, uh, they trick everyone into loving five guys because they just throw some extra fries in there. Now, they don't just throw some extra fries in the people's bags that they like. They always throw extra fries in the bags. Why? Because fries are cheap. And they know that if they just charge you a little bit more money and then they throw a bunch of fries in there and make you feel like you got extra you're going to feel like they did you something good and therefore you're going to like them. And it works. And it works. Um, to, to do a little extra good for people as you go along uh, makes society better. So we have people who don't really care about us uh, in the U.S., Europeans, other places. They don't really care. They see it th us through their 
uh, perspectives. But uh, one of the things I've noticed is that the Europeans are more disconnected politically, it seems like, than, than Americans. Uh, there's more Europeans that are just kind of like, I don't know what's going on. I don't really care. It's like they kind of understand that they are not really free. Um, they have this illusion of choice. They have this illusion of, but they mostly just want to be left alone uh, by the government. And they just kind of pretend like the government's not there. In America, people, I guess, try to do that, but it's a little harder, it seems like. I, I, uh, I saw this and I had to see it for myself. So it's, you can try this yourself. If you go to Google and you type in why censorship and then just let it see what options it populates. Why censorship and let it populate. Now, the top suggestion to its credit was why censorship is bad. Okay. But basically everything below that was very troubling. And uh, I saw the people that were doing this were showing that, that it wasn't showing that why censorship is bad at the top. It was just like, it was just all the, the, the stuff that I'm going to tell you. Number two, why censorship in schools is good. Number three, why censorship is important in schools. Number four, why censorship is important. After that, why censorship should be allowed. And then why censorship is good. If that doesn't tell you everything you need to know about Google, Google is a European government functioning as a tech company. And I can't wait. Um, and I think that, that we're starting to see it. Some of these um, AI is going to basically compete directly with Google. Uh, so uh, there's one AI that's, uh, was it OpenAI, is coming out to compete openly with Google. Now, Open OpenAI is not a good AI because they're, they're basically just as bad as Google. But the idea that there's going to be competition in the... Uh, in the search space. Now I know we've had other search engines that, that can kind of do what Google does, but they're usually not very good. Um, you know, DuckDuck, um, DuckDuckGo, and some of these other ones. I mean, they try, but they just can't find stuff. That's just the problem, is that Google has so much information and has gotten so good at processing it that these other competitors I try to use them, but then just like, it doesn't get me what I need. And so I end up back at Google. Uh, to have these AI that are going to get us away from Google, I really, I really hope we, we move there soon. And hopefully a couple trust, trustworthy uh, um, AIs come out. Grok, hopefully we'll start a search um, function at some point soon. I think we're gonna see that. Uh, Elon Musk is going all in on AI now. Uh, so hopefully you can come up with a non-woke AI uh, that Grok, uh, Grok already does some fun stuff. If you occasionally see some, uh, some uh, interesting thumbnails on here that uh, look AI generated, it's because Grok came up with something good. Uh, and uh, I'm playing around with it a little bit. Uh, AI is really just coding. It's not, you know, they say it's artificial intelligence. It's not. It's really just a shell game. It's an artificial computer program that's just not, it's not as good as us, okay? <laughs> and it's not going to supplant us, uh, at least right now. Uh, so um, definitely some things on the horizon, uh, but how, how do we deal with this stuff? One, step back. Step back from looking at Washington, D.C. and realize that, that we need to survive and we need to have a reason to survive that is focused in on us. Are we good people? Are we becoming better people? Are we in right relationships with others and with God? If that's the case, then, then, then we have motivation to survive so that we can continue to be in good relationship with other people. So that we have opportunities to do good for other people. And when you think about it that way, you're going to prep differently. You're going to stockpile a little differently. You're going to stockpile different things, if you know what I mean. 
You're going to stockpile more to help other people. You're going to take care of yourself and your family, but then you're also going to be stockpiling to help other people. And you're going to build that into your plans because there needs to be a goal. You can't be just hiding in your bunker, just going, I'm going to survive another day so I can eat some more beans. You're going to find several weeks into that that you don't want to do that anymore. All right, friends. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of days here, uh, but we're, we're going to be in for a ride. Uh, when you hit your limit, turn it off. Okay? Turn off the TV. Turn off the, the phones. Turn off. Just go for a walk. Unplug. Guess what? You unplugging is not going to change what's going to happen. Go out and vote. After you've voted, after you've encouraged everyone you can to vote, you can unplug. And you can just take a few days off. You can take a week off and then just see what happens, okay? Because what happens will happen. Uh, might want to stay away from the stores for a little bit until you know that things are okay. Because uh, they might not have any more TVs after all of the uh, leftists take them. Uh, or maybe maybe we're going to be taking them. I don't know. I don't know. Um, do the losers get the, comp- get, the, uh, get the free TVs? Losers get TVs? I I don't know. It's like a game show. (laughs) Consolation prize. All right, friends. um, Let me know what you guys think down in the comments down below. Um, These are tough things that we're we're thinking about. I know a lot of you guys are thinking about these things. And uh, hopefully I give you a little bit of perspective or some unique perspectives that may be helpful. All right, friends. If you want to check out another video from this channel, there's one right up there. I'll see you over there. Or I'll see you guys later. Steve Poplar of the Poplar Report out.